Good evening, everyone. I'm Pamela Malloy. I am the creative director of the Wild Writers Festival and the editor of the New Quarterly. And I'd like to welcome you to the ninth annual Wild Writers Festival. Um, normally, we are gathered together at uh, the Balsillie School for a weekend in the first uh, weekend of November, but this time we're spread out across the month of November, and this is our final week of a three-week festival. And I have to say that we've been really, really delighted about the Sears Festival. Um, there's been some great conversations and some workshops, and we're really excited that all of you have turned out so much. Uh, we've had great, great attendance. So thank you for coming and thank you for being here. I know it's hard to be on Zoom all the time, so we appreciate you coming. Um, I'd also like to thank our donors and sponsors. I mean, we when we changed to to the pivoted to the online, we were really happy that our donors and sponsors came with us, and we've picked up quite a lot of you along the way to who have joined the uh, support for the festival. So thank you for that as well. Um, I also want to thank uh, Emily Bednars and our tech team who have done a phenomenal job in making this festival run so smoothly. Thank you, Emily and Mich Michaela tonight helping out in the background. Um, tonight's conversation is uh, led by Vin Nguyen, and, and he will be speaking to two very talented um, authors, and I'm really excited and proud to say that we have actually published both of these authors, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Jack Wang and Suvankam Thamabonska. And a special congratulations to uh, Suvankam on her recent Giller win. We're really excited about that. So I'm going to introduce Vin, and then I'm going to turn it over to him, who's going to, he will then turn, he will then introduce Suvan and Jack. So Vin Nguyen specializes in refugee, immigrant, and diasporic literature and culture. In 2017, he was awarded the John C. Polanyi Prize in Literature. He is currently working on a critical memoir. I have the great pleasure of working with Vin because he's also a nonfiction editor for the New Quarterly where he helps to create the Scattering series. In this series, Vin has introduced us to many new refugee voices and immigrant voices, and he's also a great pleasure to work with. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Vin, and we'll all sit back and enjoy this conversation. Thanks, Pamela, and um, thank you to the entire TNQ team for mounting this amazing uh, festival, um, you know, this amazing event during exceptional times. Um, so kudos to you all. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you especially to Jack and Subankam for uh, being here to share with us everything they know about short stories. Um, it is my immense pleasure to uh, introduce you to our two marquee uh, writers of the night. First, uh, Jack Wang uh, received his uh, Bachelor's of Science from the University of Toronto, an MFA from the University of Arizona, and a PhD in English with an emphasis in creative writing from Florida State University. In 2014 to 2015, he held the David T. K. Wong uh, Creative Writing Fellowship at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. Stories in this debut collection, We Two Alone, published by House of Anansi Press, have been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and longlisted for the Journey Prize and have appeared in Prism International, The Malahat Review, The New Quarterly, The Humber Literary Review, and Joyland. Originally from Vancouver, uh, Jack is an associate professor in the Department of Writing at Ithaca College in New York, where he lives with his wife, novelist Angelina Marabella, and their two daughters. Suvankam Tamavangsa is the author of four uh, poetry books and the short story collection, How to Pronounce Knife, a New York Times editor's choice. And it is published by McClellan and Stewart in Canada, Little Brown in the US and Bloomsbury in the UK. As many of you know, it won the prestigious Scotia Bank uh, Giller Prize just last week. Her stories have won <clears throat> an O. Henry Award and appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, The Atlantic and Granta. She was born in the Lao refugee camp in Nongkai, Thailand, and was raised and educated in Toronto, where she now lives. So um, thank you so much uh, for being here to the both of you. Um, I must begin with congratulations. Uh, Suvankam, what an amazing achievement, the 2020 Giller Prize. Um, I'm still so thrilled for you. Um, 
And Jack, congratulations on, uh, on your debut book. Um, it really is a magnificent collection and one that I'm sure will appear on many shortlists in the coming year. So we'll look forward to celebrating you then. Um, so cheers to you both. Um, both How to Pronounce Knife and We Two Alone attest to the strength of the Canadian short story. Um, this is a vibrant form, it's alive, and it's only getting better in your heads. Um, and with the richness of both of your collections, I think there's, there's really so much to talk about, um, particularly in terms of identity, migration, and race. But I'm really excited that we have this opportunity to tonight um, to focus on questions of form and craft, right? Um, and so, um, you know, part of what we're going to be doing is to shed light on this tricky, efficient, and effective nature of short storytelling. Um, so I'll begin uh, with the first question, which is, um, you know, what excites you about short stories, uh, about writing short stories? Um, what is so unique or special about this form? And what can it do that um, other genres, such as the novel or, or poetry or drama, um, cannot do? So um, maybe I'll ask Jack that, Chris. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, let me just begin by thanking you, Vin, for uh, moderating tonight's event. Uh, I want to add my congratulations uh, to Zivancom as well. And I um, want to thank Pamela, Emily, and Michaela for uh, running this show. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll just start by saying that, you know, the, the short story is a very elastic form and in part because the length of a short story can vary so much. And so, you know, I hesitate to make, you know, forceful statements about the short story because it is such an elastic form and can do so many different things. Um, I think that one of the things that the short story often does is it takes in a whole life uh, at a glance. Um, I think of poetry or at least traditional lyric poetry as, as emphasizing the moment and the novel as taking a long, hard look at a life. And the novel, of course, has that kind of autobiograph autobiographical reach. Mm -hmm. um, but a short story um, by its nature, uh, by the limits of length, can only you know, work by synecdoche to represent you know, the whole. Um, you know, a part representing the whole. And so, uh, you know, I think that's the challenge for the writers to the, the, the art of selectivity, the art of, um, you know, synecdoche, the art of the glance and finding um, that part of the life that's gonna suggest the contours of, of the whole. And, you know, I think about Sue's stories, you know, all of her stories, I feel like an, I can infer the contours of the rest of the character's life from the incidents that I've read about. And, um, you know, I think that's what uh, the, the short story does particularly well, is to take in a whole life um, in a single glance. Does that make it more difficult than the other genres? Um, I mean, this, this, this idea of being able to have, to, to, to really capture the glance, right? Yeah, it can be it can be more difficult, but you know, you asked about what excites me about writing short stories, and you know, one of the things that excites me is that the short story actually allows me to indulge my worst tendencies as a writer, which is to be slow and to be a perfectionist. <laughs> and you know, a novel is hard to perfect because it's because of its length; it's so long, it's very hard to pour over every sentence. Uh, of course, it's, it's helpful if you write faster rather than slower when you're working on a novel. But right. a short story allows me to indulge those tendencies and in that way to try to perfect, um, or at least attempt to perfect, I should say, mm -hmm. you know, it can be a challenging and difficult form. Yeah, I think just as you're speaking, I'm thinking about how it might be more difficult to hide the flaws in a short story, right? I'm thinking, right. yeah, in the novel, people will just keep reading. Um, yeah. You can have these little holes. You have yeah. to let go of things, but in a short yeah. story, yeah, those mm -hmm. holes can be more noticeable. Right. Suvanka? Um, I really agree with Jack in that, um, you know, a short, I feel like a short story can give you everything that a novel can, but it doesn't waste your time. 
it also allows you to make more artistic choices. When you have a character in a short story, um, you can variate them more in a collection. If you begin with a child in a collection, you can also have someone in their 70s. If you begin with someone who works in a chicken processing factory, you can also have another an, a, a whole different universe, like such as picking worms. But in a novel, you're limited to that world and that character. And in a novel, I think you also kind of have to force a reader to kind of like that main character um, because you're going to you're going to live with that person for the next 300 pages whereas with a short story you can make that character as terrible and horrible but you can also make them fall in love with that character because the space is so tiny that you don't have room to to um, fall out of love with them right um, right your also, question oh, sorry, go ahead. oh and i wanted to ask um i think one of the lovely things about the short story is that you work under the pressure that it it can't sell or that people won't read it and the fact that you you know you make the artistic choice to say who cares i'm going to do what i want to do and the way that i want to do it um is really lovely and um, like that is what draws me to the short story in that um, there are all these ideas of what it is and what it should be. Um, and I get to define that as a writer. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways you're not working in the dominant form, right? You're not working in right. that space where, where you're supposed to be doing certain things. Um, but your answer got me thinking about the relationship between stories within the collection too, right? So that when you're, I mean, you're, of course, when you're writing a short story, you're writing a story. Um, right. but, but, but we also know that there's a relationship between how that story functions Absolutely. and how that they, world functions. They or The stories orbit around each other. They're either tangential or they pick into or they kick against um, or they... Um, or they are in absence of um, something that a story in the collection doesn't do or does. Mm -hmm. um, like there's so many choices um, within a collection to move, to move and to make all the time. Oh, that's so brilliant. Um, can you share with us a short story that has stayed with you? Um, or one that has taught you important lessons about crafting short stories. Um, so I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm teaching a class in fiction right now, so I'm teaching stories, um, but I'm wondering about how people learn from short stories. So if you can kind of, uh, Sue, maybe start by, by telling us a story that you love. Okay, the short story that comes to mind in which, you know, I've read this story like a hundred times and every time I come to it, it always feels new and it makes me cry like a baby when I get to the end. It always does that to me, even though I know what's coming and I know how it's gonna come. It is Alice Munro's Dimensions. Um, we begin the story with a scene of how this woman um, learns how to know how to, knows how to do CPR. Uh, we don't know, I'm, she talks about, um, so what happens is she's in a bad marriage and her, her, her life is turned upside down and her children are, are murdered by, by the husband. But um, when she talks about the children, she only says, Sasha is born. She, she doesn't talk about, you know, what the baby looked like, how it was conceived, the love of the, that she had with the father. She doesn't talk about, you know, it's clothing or the, the being a mother. She just has that one sentence, Sasha was born. And there's all this space around it, behind it, below it. And visually, but also just how small that little sentence is it's a sentence and it's a paragraph all on its own. Um, and it says, it says so much about love and loss and all it's saying is Sasha is born. Um, I just, I love the work that Alice Monroe makes those three words do. Um, 
they, they do such heavy lifting. Um, you know, you don't, to be powerful, you don't have to have a lot of words. You can just have these little words and they're, they're doing so much in so small and narrow a space. Wow, I kind of want to cry just listening to you talk about that story. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, Jack? Um, a story I, I admire quite a bit is called uh, Our Lady of Paris by Daniel Moynudin. Uh, it appears in his collection in Other Rooms, Other Wonders. And it's about a young Pakistani man who goes to Yale, uh, meets an American girl, and then goes back to Pakistan while she finishes her senior year. And then at Christmas time, um, they decide to meet up in Paris. And uh, his parents insinuate themselves <laughs> and uh, want to go to Paris too to meet this American girl. And you can imagine how things go. Um, and uh, I admire this story, you know, for, you know, some of the formal elements, you know, uh, char characterization, it's the, the formal elegance of the language, uh, the, you know, the handling of the relationship at the heart of it. But what I particularly admire and, and learn from is its worldliness, um, the way uh, it crosses oceans very easily and, and makes, um, you know, uh, makes you feel a kind of global citizen. I mean, this is a story that goes from Asia to North America to, to Europe in, um, you know, a heartbeat. Mm. And so I learned from that for my own work, which uh, is about, you know, this collection is about the Chinese diaspora and it's set on five continents. And um, so, you know, that's something I definitely learned from. Um, but I admired it so much um, that I actually, one of the stories, Belsize Park in my collection, is a kind of reworking of that story. And that's, that's another way that we can learn is simply to imitate the stories that we, we love or to imitate some element or some effect that a uh, you know, story uh, has created. Uh, for example, what Sue just described, you know, that kind of effect might be something you try in your own story. But in this case, what I did was I took certain elements, the relationship at the heart of formidable mother and, um, and then, you know, sort of took the vessel of the story and poured some different content into it, as it were. And I think the short story is, is short enough as a form to learn something just by, um, you know, trying to, to imitate it in some way, in, in some very overt way. Right, right, right. Um, so you were talking about movement and that story, sort of the way which it sort of traverses space, right? And, and the, this title of the panel, gestures to movement. So I want to ask you about how you move a story along, right? How do you get from point A to point B? What drives the internal shape or structure of, of a story for you? Is it about arriving at an epiphany or a revelation? Um, is it about capturing a certain feeling or an insight? Is it really about discovering how in, an idiosyncratic individual um, reacts to life, right? I guess the question is, um, how do you write so that you can bring a story towards a certain point? You know, whether that point is a completion or an ending or, um, or just a moment or a stasis. Uh, Sue, maybe you wanna start with that? I like stories that don't end neatly. I know you talked about like moving from point A to point B. Um, I think there is, I mean, I, I understand that movement. Um, and I think my stories move in that same way, but I don't think I'm getting, I'm moving to point B. I'm thinking of point C. So what's on the page is the movement from A to B, but mm -hmm. as the writer, um, I'm at point C and I'm deciding, you know, uh, what is on the page and what isn't, but I'm always positioning on point C, like one step ahead of readers as they move from point A to point B. Mm. Jack? Um, yeah, it's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think of a, 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 an essay by John Barth, and on the surface, John Barth's fiction couldn't be more different than what I'm doing. Um, but the title of his essay, which happens to be on plot, is called Incremental Perturbations. 
and he, it, he's using that phrase half facetiously. Um, but, you know, I, I think about stories, you know, progressing through incremental perturbations, through disturbances, you know, that, that continue to, you know, deepen throughout the course of the story. And I don't know if I think so much about movement uh, you know, that's a common way of conceptualizing it. I, I, it's, for me, it's more about pressure. You know, the feeling that as you go along, there's, you're creating more and more pressure through these disturbances. And, you know, different writers create those disturbances in different ways. Like I think of writers as having different dials that they turn up, you know, to different levels in ways that are native to way, the way they use language, the way they see the world. And, you know, if there are basic dials, they're probably character, plot, and, and language, you know. And, and, you know, every writer's challenge is to find, you know, the place where those dials produce the most heat for you. And for me, I, I tend to turn up the dial on, on event. You know, I tend to, to, to use incident as a way of driving my stories. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's often how I'm creating those um, incremental perturbations or disturbances. And I think about pressure in each one of those scenes, scene upon scene, um, is kind of like adding, you know, proverbial piece of straw until you get to that irrevocable moment. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, I, let's, um, let's, actually uh, do some reading. Um, you know, we're gonna have uh, Jack and Sue uh, read, um, but we're gonna change it up a bit and ask them to read each other's work. Uh, so both Sue and Jack have uh, these amazing stories about uh, or set during Halloween. Um, so Jack will read from Sue's story, Chikichi, and uh, then Sue will read from Jack's story, um, All Hollows. So Jack, could you start us off? Sure. Um, I'm just going to preface this story a little bit because I'm going to be reading from the second section. Um, basically, in the first section, we learned that the narrator, who's six, and her brother, who's seven, they're sometimes left at home by their parents because the parents have to work. And so the father gives them some instructions about, you know, trying to uh, not answer the door, even how to wield an axe. And um, on one occasion, somebody does come knocking on the door, screaming, uh, open the door, I've got a knife. Um, but the father happens to be home and nothing much comes of that particular incident. So um, this is the second section uh, of the story. Most Saturdays, dad drove us all out to a neighborhood we wished we could live in with wide tree line roads and big Victorian homes. It was something we did on our way to Chinatown to buy groceries. We would drive slowly down the street pick which house we wanted to live in, and point to the window where we wanted our bedrooms to be. My parents and my brother always chose the large sprawling houses, but I paid attention to things people left outside. Sometimes there were hockey sticks, unmarked goalie pads, and a net left out in the driveway, or a pink bike abandoned on the front lawn. It seemed to me no one here was ever afraid someone would take their stuff if they could just leave it all lying out in the open like that, not put away or locked up with a chain. One time I noticed that every house on the street had raw pumpkins on their front steps, either a giant one or a cluster of little ones. There were faces carved into most of them, triangle eyes, a circle for a nose, and a mouth with one or two teeth hanging from inside, a wide smile. A few of them had seeds pulled out and arranged around the pumpkin's mouth as if it were throwing up. At school, we had painted orange circles or cut them out of orange cardboard paper and glued googly eyes on them. I leaned forward from the back seat and asked dad, how come people here love pumpkins so much? And he said, hmm, seems like a waste of food to me. After we looked at all those pumpkins, dad said to mom, no one would put poison or sharp blades in their candy in a neighborhood like this, would they? Then he turned back to us and yelled, I've got a knife, open the door. And me and my brother screamed like we were scared, but we were not at all. After that in October of every year, until my brother turned nine, our parents always took us out to Chikichi. The first time we went, my brother put 
a white bedsheet over his head with holes cut out for his eyes and for his arms. Dad didn't have much time to make him anything. He had spent weeks making me a tight-fitting long sleeve black shirt and matching pants with glow-in-the-dark fabric bones sewn on in the front. In the dark, you wouldn't see me at all. You would just see a skeleton walking across the room. It made my brother squeal with excitement, knowing that someday soon this outfit would be passed on to him like everything else I'd ever had. It was unusual to see dad come home from work so early. I didn't understand why and worried he'd lost his job. It was something he always told us that he had to work long hours or he wouldn't have a job at all. But then he told us to put on our, co sorry, to put our costumes on and he drove us out to that neighborhood we wanted to live in even though we weren't buying groceries. Dad parked the car and told us we were to walk from house to house dressed like this, then yell, chicka chee, at the person who answered the door and hold out our open pillowcases for them to fill with all kinds of candies. I did not believe him. I was certain then that he really had lost his job and what we were doing was part of his plan to send us away, something our parents often threatened when we were misbehaving or we wanted something they didn't have the money for. I wanted to cry, but I saw how my brother was looking at me, like he needed me to be brave to the both of us. Dad got out of the car and tilted the seat forward so my brother and I could get out. He took us both by the hand and led us to the first house. It was huge, the windows as large as doors, and I wondered who lived here. As my brother and I climbed up the front steps alone, we turned around to make sure dad was still there. He was standing by the curb, hands in his pockets, only pulling them out to puff warm air into them. He was dressed in a light jacket and jeans, his idea of looking good. A warm coat and mittens would cramp his style. When he noticed us still standing on the steps, just looking at him, he encouraged us to go on, lifting both arms and sweeping the air in front of him, reminding us, say chicka chee. When we got to the door, we stood there trying to find the doorbell, like Dad had told us to do. That's how you know it's a nice house, he had said. It's so big, no one inside would hear a knock at the front door, so you have to push a button to ring a bell. My brother tapped my arm and pointed to the button on the right side of the door. It turned out that neither of us could reach it. I lifted my brother up, and he pressed the doorbell once and again, and then I let him down softly. A light came on and a woman with brown shoulder length hair and blunt bangs opened the door. She wore glasses and had a friendly smile. She said, well, now you, you are a ghost and you are, oh my, look at that costume. Now, isn't that a sight? Where did you get that? Did your mother make it? I was too nervous to answer her. So I whispered, chicka chee. Oh, Harold, come out here. These children are just so adorable. Harold, get out here. Harold came to the door, shuffling his fluffy slippers along the floor. Chicka chee, I said again softly. Harold gave a laugh and said, Elaine, that is so adorable. Give the kids a little extra, won't you? And he reached for a large glass bowl from somewhere behind the door and dropped two bags of potato chips in each pillowcase. As soon as the treats were in our pillowcases, we both shouted, Chicka chee, and ran away from the house, giggling like we'd gotten away with something we never thought we could have. We ran to dad who was still standing by the curb and showed him the potato chip bags at the bottom of the pillowcases. See, I told you, he said, just say chicka chee. Thank you so much, Jack. <laughs> that was really wonderful, Jack. Um, what an amazing reading. It's so lovely to hear you know, what you've made come out of someone else's mouth because I totally forgot that I wrote that. Like, it felt like I was, I was, I was a listener, a reader, and I, it's so, to release it, you know, to, to give it to somebody else and have it be for them. Um, it's so lovely to, to just listen and sit back and enjoy. Um, well, the pleasure was all mine, and I'm looking forward to the same. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to um, like kind of explain 
where we are in the short story or what comes after or anything about the characters. The scene that I picked to read is, in, you know, we, we talked about movement and tension and what's there and what's not. And the way that Jack works um, in this, in these, in these pages um, is absolutely stunning. All Hollows. As he started up the walk, the front door opened and Ben, his older boy, appeared on the threshold. Dad, where were you? He cried. He raced down the steps, then stopped abruptly, checking himself. Ernie crouched, arms wide. In an overflow of relief, Ben ran the rest of the way and slung his head over his father's shoulder. Ernie squeezed his son with the feeling of being watched, a feeling he had always had as a parent, but all the more so since getting divorced. Now that he only saw Krista passing the kids back and forth, he found himself performing, overacting, to prove in those fleeting moments of contact his ability to father. But when he looked up, she wasn't there blocking the doorway, which seemed a good sign, a virtual invitation. So he poked his head in the door. Toby, his four-year-old, was playing with cars on the living room floor. On the other side of the kitchen peninsula, his wife, his ex-wife stood in profile at the sink, lost in the sound of running water. Hey, Toby, he whispered. Toby looked up serenely, then went back to his cars, reproof, it seemed, for last night. Then again, the boy had always been remote, like his mother, especially after the accident that had left him half blind in one eye. Mom, dad's here, Ben shouted. Krista turned and smiled absentmindedly. Then she looked up and her smile dissolved. Last night, she'd left two messages on his machine. The first, you've got to be kidding, Ernie. The second, I'm starting to get worried. Call me when you get this. He'd left a message at the office where she tempted hoping a night of worry might expand to regret, even love. But whatever she had felt last night was gone. She shut off the water, then rounded the counter with a tea towel in her hands. She was still dressed for work in a shimmery blouse with a bow collar, her blonde hair up in a loose bun, and the air of naughty secretary made him wince inwardly. He didn't like the thought of her out in the world looking better than she had at 19. So what happened? When he'd first proposed Halloween, she'd said, that might be doable and left it at that. He could have accused her of ambiguity, but didn't. Instead, he lied. Long shifts at work, compounding exhaustion, a mishap with the alarm. I'm sorry, Ben, Tobes. Krista studied him. Then she walked over, arms raised. Her first hug in months and surprisingly tender. Maybe a night of lying awake had indeed dredged up old feelings. He rubbed his hands together happily, theatrically. So how much candy did you get? We didn't get any candy. How come? We didn't go trick-or-treating. What do you mean you didn't go? He turned to Krista accusingly. They wouldn't go, she replied calmly. They wanted you, fell asleep, fell asleep waiting. Don't worry, dad, mom bought candy. Well, that's not the same, is it? His plan had been to extract the boys for ice cream, but now he had a new plan. Go put on your costumes. Toby looked up 
his milky eye darting. Ernie, why not, he asked strangely, pleased with himself. Now the boys were on his side, clamoring. Just a few houses, he said, just to say we did. He expected a glare, but she seemed unusually composed. All right, she said, wait here, we'll just be a minute. As she helped the boys get ready, he thought about her sudden embrace. Back in college, after months of seeming indifference, she snuck, on, she snuck up on him at a party and squeezed his arm in passing, and the world opened up. And though she would grant much more on her skinny single in Schumacher Hall and in the room where she'd slept as a child on a dauntingly quiet street, in Eau Claire, and in the lakeside cottage in the Dells where he had proposed, he still thought of that fleeting exchange as the most intimate moment of their courtship. Maybe today was another opening. The boys came running out, Ben in a red nose and a rainbow wig. Dad, what do you think? A clown and a monkey? It's what they wanted. What's wrong, you don't like it? Like it? I love it, my son's bozo and bubbles. Krista didn't flinch. Instead, she hustled the boys to the door. Have fun, she said. Don't be long. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, you both. That's they're, oh, just beautiful. And, I know, and... right? <laughs> so beautiful. I'm just... I, yeah. <laughs> like, did, I didn't have to say, I mean, you just go in, you just go in and then it's yeah. there and it opens. Yeah. yeah. And I think just to, just to hear these stories be performed and be giving a different life, you know, it's, it's so different. It's so different um, from, from how you, how you would have read it. And, and, and absolutely oh, like, but like yeah. the father's voice, you know, if I, you know, I have like, a girly high voice. And when I do my father, you know, the father's voice in that short story, it doesn't quite work, but hearing Jack do it, you know, oh. like like when he says, um, all you have to do is just say chicka chee, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Um, okay, so why Halloween? Uh, what is it that intrigues you about this, this holiday or event, right? One where uh, people dress up, you know, you encounter strangers. Uh, where the natural and the supernatural world meets. Um, why, why is Halloween a place, a, 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 an event for you to build your stories? Jack? Um, well, I just want to say that, you know, something that I love uh, about Chikuchi is the way that it, it defamiliarizes Halloween in a number of different ways, like from a child's point of view, from the newcomer's point of view, um, even from a class perspective, you know, somehow, you know, suddenly the doorbell yeah. is this exotic, different thing. It, you know, this, it makes strange things that we've become accustomed to, which, you know, is what good fiction does. And, and um, you know, in a way, my, my choosing Halloween is also a way of making it strange. We think about this ritual where people agree to, you know, give candy to strangers' children on this agreed upon day. But then going out the next day and doing the same thing is suddenly absolutely absurd. And it's an intrusion, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's impermissible, it's intrusive, it's ridiculous. And so this, this, this character is probably, um, you know, one, one of the best compliments I got about this collection was the description of this character. Somebody said he was a, a blazing fuck up. And, you know, that made me really happy that that's the way this character was, um, you know, was, was being read. And this is, you know, his forgetting Halloween and taking his kids out the next day and suddenly turning something that, you know, people have agreed upon into something intrusive and strange. It's just part of, you know, it was part of just dramatizing this guy and the way he was bumbling through life. But, um, yeah, I also think that, you know, it, it's also a very public sort of ritual, uh, not a private one. So it's, it's, an, uh, it's an occasion that, that gets the character out in the world and interacting. That's another element of Halloween that, that I, I thought was, um, you know, good plot engine. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, he's such a, he's such a memorable character. I actually had a dream that uh, was very similar to the ending of your story. <laughs> um, that's how it was. It, it, it entered into my my uh, my unconscious. So. Are we allowed to talk about the ending? I mean, would it be giving it away? I mean, it's so yeah. No, great. don't 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 <laughs> don't give it away. Don't okay, give it away. Okay. Uh, but Sue, yeah, what do you think? Why? What? What? What is the function of of this 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 event for you, Halloween Um, for me, it's it's the way in which we all agree on this one day to do all these things. Um, and, and just the candy, you know, I, and the language in the way that, you know, what does trick or treat, trick or treating mean? Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't get your treat, are you, you know, really going to, do, you know, trick, the person uh, I mean those are the rules but most of the time we get the treat um, it has it has so many ways of treatment like it could Halloween could can be scary and a horror um, but it can also be such a wonderful opportunity for humor um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know the costumes, the things we agree to, the silly, the pumpkins. Um, yeah, I just, for me, I really, it was really somebody had said that when I was a kid, I said chicka chee and they, they just thought that was hilarious. And um, I just wanted to write a story about how you can say it the way that you want to say it because that day or that experience is yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, I have one last question, um, which is a question about time and temporality. Um, and that um, it seems like decades can transpire within a paragraph. Uh, and I'm thinking, Jack, about uh, the end of, of, of the nature of things, right? That brilliant ending. Um, an entire life is lived uh, in between, in the break between paragraphs, right? Uh, so I'm thinking about Slingshot and, and Randy Travis as well. Um, you know, people lose one another, they recognize themselves, they move on, they return. So, so much happens. Um, and, and it seems that the short story is such a great way to experiment with time, right? The ways in which it condenses and expands time. So can you talk about the way in which you play with time uh, and write about time? So Sue, do you want to start? I think um, that a lot of time can pass but feelings don't change with that time. I think mm -hmm. the, the compass within all of my stories is that the feelings are the same. Um, a lot of the stories are told in the point of view of a child and then in the end we realize it's an adult um, mm -hmm. and, and it's a surprise because I think when adults recall moments in their childhood, um, they t speak in the language that they themselves use as a child. Um, and those feelings, the, the, origin the original moments that they first encountered of events or of people, those things are impressed upon them and they don't change over time. Even though time's, time moves and passes um, and grows and unfolds, the feelings and the moment that you first feel them, they remain forever the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, all stories are upon a time. Um, all, all stories deal with the nature of time. I mean, I think of poetry as sometimes freezing time, but I think, you know, with stories, you're always dealing with the pathos of, of time. And this is, especially evident and felt in novels because not only do you often, you know, you know, traverse more time, but you've just spent so long uh, with that work that by the end you feel time's passage. And so, you know, you have to um, stretch time in different ways in a short story to, to evoke the same pathos of time. And for me, I'm sort of shamelessly about trying to make readers feel something at the end. I mean, that's, that's my like, 
basically my MO is to make readers feel, you know, mm -hmm. at the end. And, you know, time is one of those things that we feel deeply about. It's, you know, relentless forward march, you know, it's irreversibility. And, um, you know, there are a couple of times in the collection where I'm very deliberately uh, speeding through time at the end as a, as a deliberate effect, you know, and, and I, make, I make choices to try to produce feelings, not to, to say something, um, but to, to um, produce effects in the reader. And so sometimes, you know, the contrast of time moving at a certain pace and then su suddenly moving very quickly uh, you know, you mentioned Randy Travis uh, and, and Sue's story, and that might be my favorite in, in the collection. And, um, you know, it, it, as you say, in the white space, it traverses decades and it's, it's really potent. And, and through those moves, um, we're able to feel, even in a short story, mm -hmm. I think the pathos of time um, as we typically do uh, in a novel. So, you know, I was thinking of stories, I was thinking of like on Chesil Beach, uh, when I wrote on the nature of things, the way the story is so meticulously focused on one evening, but then at the, at the end of the novella or, or short novel, it just right. races through decades. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I love that effect. And that's what I mean by imitation is sometimes we just like, that's a cool effect. I want to, I want to yeah. try that and, and try it. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, in the universe would be so cruel. I don't talk about, or I don't reproduce the scene of where the bride is jilted. All I say is, I just use the word jilted. I don't describe mm -hmm. the tears, the crying, mm -hmm. or how everyone reacts. We know what jilted is, and the fact that that word is by itself, and it's bare, and it's alone, I feel like it, it does what I want it to do. Right. Um, so I think that that might be a really good uh, segue into our uh, Q and A. We have uh, a lot of questions from from the audience, uh, and one of them here is, "What are your tips and strategies for giving stories density?" You know, I think we're 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 kind of having that conversation already, right? Like saying a lot with a few words. You know, how how do you do that? It might seem simple to do, but but yeah. I just think you get old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get some life experience, right? Like to understand your feelings, mm. you can't just say sad. Um, there's a difference between just using that word and really knowing the variations and the degrees and the meanings of sadness without using the word sad. And really that's just about growing old and, um, and sitting and processing, not just what happens to you, but other people's life experiences around you like why do they make those real life choices or why do you make them and trying to understand that um I think brings some density to the writing mm -hmm. and I think you build around that word too right um mm -hmm. Jack um, yeah, I mean, I guess there are different kinds of density and different ways you can conceptualize density. Um, certainly there can be like an emotional density, um, psychological density, but you know, I always think, I, I think of my short stories in this collection, um, I'm, I'm almost trying to, you know, to take the small container of the short story and see how much I can squeeze in, you know, into that small container in terms of incident, in terms of event, and also, a, you know, a bit of a historical scope. You know, I, I tackle things like apartheid, um, the night of broken glass, which is, you know, the, the beginnings of the Holocaust, the second Sino-Japanese war. I mean, these are pretty big events and you're trying to, you know, again, sort of see them at a glance have the part represent the whole. And um, I'm, I'm often trying to see how much um, the small container of a short story can hold. Um, so another question is, how do you get the reader to empathize with a flawed protagonist when the choices he or she makes will ultimately lead to tragedy? I, I don't pity anybody. 
Um, when I write a character, I don't feel sorry for them, um, even when I don't like them. And even when I don't want bad things to them, I, I just don't feel sorry for them. Um, I think pity is an awful feeling um, to feel for a character. Um, I just try, like if I'm cruel, I'm cruel to everybody in the story. I'm consistent in that way. <laughs> Yeah, Sue is this, you know, she's stone cold when it comes to her characters. <laughs> um, she's, she's much, you know, she's, she's much more uh, stone cold than I am, I think. I love the sister and Manny Petty, who's, you know, just, she's hilarious, but also, you know, cruel at the same time, you know, at times she's mean, but, but at the same time, it's, she's, she's endearing, you know, in her, in her um, cruelty. Um, you know, none of my characters are particularly unlikable. It's interesting, I just taught a story yesterday in, in, in A Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf. And, you know, Anders, this is a guy who's, um, you know, not very agreeable, is very hostile. And, you know, somebody, so one of my students described him as a, as a you know, a borderline serial killer which unfortunately missed the whole humanity, I think, that the story was trying to get at to, to then say he's just, a, he seems like a serial killer. So, um, you know, there's, there's you know, no way to know in the end how a reader is going to take uh, your character. Right. Um, but, um, you know, there's, 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 there's no human being that's, that's, um, you know, not going to be a deeply flawed in some way. And I think we're just trying to capture that a flaw truthfully as we can. Right. right. Um, can you talk about your research process? How do you bring research into your stories? Does the research precede the stories or do the characters come first? Um, the characters come first. Um, I try to stick with what I know. And if I don't know it, you know, that is what an imagination is for. I just make things up. Um, um, I mean, there are some things, like for example, the boxing in Manny Petty. You know, mm. I felt like I had to really know what that was. So I did, I took boxing lessons um, just to be able to describe um, what it's like to, to want to be a champion, to be close, to a champion, to be in the ring, to want all of that and to not have it. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. Sometimes um, character will come first, but sometimes I will actually root around um, until a, a, a character sort of leaps out of, um, you know, the research. Um, some of my stories are historical and, you know, I like to, to, to cite Hilary Mantel who, who says that the task of historical fiction is to take the past art out of the archive and relocate it in a body. So, you know, sometimes I do root around in the archive first, but ultimately you have to find the body in which mm -hmm. to relocate that research. Otherwise, as I tell my students, you just wind up with exempla. Like you just have information can, and, and the story is just exempla. This is what it was like to live in this time, or this is what it was like to, to be a prisoner in this XYZ prison. It's just exempla, and you have to relocate all that research in a body and see from see at eye level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so considering the economy of a short story, at what point in its drafting do you begin to pay attention to syntax and rhythm? to paint the emotional picture beneath the layer of scene and action? Um, I'm, I'm interested in how, you know, Sue composes because I'm a sort of a meticulous reviser uh, from, the, from the start. Uh, I'm not someone who sits down in one sitting, and knocks out the draft. I'm kind of a meticulous reviser. So to, to that extent, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aware of, like syntax and the, and, the, and the sentence right away. And, you know, something that I've heard most in Hamid say is that, you know, we think we read with our eyes, but we actually read with parts of our brain that are connected to the circuitry of our ears. And so 
Um, you know, I read my stuff out loud a lot from the get go. And um, how the story sounds is pretty important from the outset. It's part of the reason, again, why I'm slow and perfectionistic. And, it, and I don't necessarily recommend working that way, but it's the way I, I tend to work. Um, it depends on which short story. Um, sometimes it's not even a, um, you know, a sentence, but really a sound like um, in Edge of the World, I heard a sound in the air vent. And I just wondered who is laughing at this hour of the night and what is it about? And I built a story around that. In Slingshot, I thought about that story for like 12 years and I never wrote it down because I just found myself giggling. Um, you know, a 70 year old w woman and a 32 year old man. But then one afternoon, I just, I just got it and I wrote it in an afternoon. Um, and I don't, and I, I like to work quickly and fast like that because um, if, because those moments or that, that pace, that energy that drove me to the page, like it is contained um, in that moment and it's reenacted in the sentences. Um, I think um, that's in that story, that's how that worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to combine two questions, I think. So one about MFAs and, and, and writing programs and, 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 and taking classes for creative writing. What do you think about that? Um, and also about pitching your, your stories, right? How do you sell your stories? How do you, how do you get published? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I'll just chime in briefly about, you know, getting an MFA or what have you. I mean, I think that, you know, like learning anything else um, writing requires you to put in uh, thousands and thousands of reps. And, you know, um, to the extent that an MFA program allows you to write and to read, you know, it will help you get into, get in those thousands and thousands of reps. You can do it on your own. Um, but I think that uh, the MFA gives you some concentrated time and it can accelerate the process. Of, of, you know, getting in those thousands of reps, but you still have to put in those thousands of hours um, at the computer, uh, whether you're in school or not. Right. And Sue? Well, or, I, have, are you publishing? I have to be careful because I'm an MFA advisor. So, you know, <laughs> if I trash you know, the idea of the MFA, <laughs> I would, you know, um, that's not very good for me. But I would have to say, um, it depends on what kind of writer you are. Like, maybe you yourself are just obsessed with writing all the time. You don't need somebody to tell you, you know, get to the page. This is a story. Um, and, you know, even those who do go enter MFA programs, there's no guarantee that what you write is gonna become a book. Or, you know, um, uh, many people graduate from those programs and we don't hear from them again, you know. Um, there's no guarantee. Um, the only guarantee is that you arrive at the page with, and, you, and, you, and the desire that want um, is there with you. Um, I myself, um, you know, I've, I, I took only two creative writing classes, one in high school and one as an undergrad in university. I never lost my desire to arrive at the page and to write nobody. I mean, I wake up in the morning and all I talk about is writing. I, I'm very boring. <laughs> all right, we um, don't have much time left. So maybe in, in one sentence, what makes a good writing? Or sorry, what makes a good ending? Um, leaving people devastated. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. Like I said earlier, um, I'm shamelessly about trying to move people. And I'll just say that I, you know, I love how sometimes the final line of Sue's stories will just make the story ring in a way 
um, that the story wouldn't without it. So some of your endings are very <laughs> devastating and beautiful. Um, thank you, thank you. All right, I think we have run out of time. Um, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Sue. This has been such an amazing treat. Thank you, so, Jack. Um, thank you, Vin. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Really great questions. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna jump in here just to say thank you to all three, Jack and Vin and, and Suvanka. This has been really an amazing conversation. And I think we probably could be talking for another hour and still not cover everything. <laughs> I think you know, for if, if our audience is like me, they've been busy taking lots of notes and and really enjoying the discussion of going doing a deeper dive into writing short stories. And I think it's safe to say we'll never think of Halloween in quite the same way again. <laughs> so I I would like to encourage uh, our audience to go out um, and purchase these books. Um, which are available from our, our, our official bookseller, Wordsworth Books here in, in Waterloo. Um, if that's not feasible because we've had people from across the country, please go to your local independent um, bookstore and purchase books. They make great Christmas presents, great birthday presents, or just great presents for yourself. Um, I just want to also just remind our viewers that uh, the festival is brought to you free of charge. And if you are so feel moved to donate to, to, to in support of the festival, um, please, we've, we've got a link in our, our chat. We welcome that. Um, and we I just want to remind people that we have our next event, which is tomorrow night, and it's in uh, with Lamise Alathari. We'll be interviewing Antonio Michael Downing on narrating memory and disbelonging. Thank you again. Uh, this has been really a terrific conversation and I look forward to seeing you all in some form or another sometime soon. And thank you audience for joining us tonight. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night.